The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings. Welcome to the 2016 Black Sustainability Summit. This is Afi Arena and Mama Nobantu on Kuanda. We are your moderators for the evening. Um, Baba Kashan Myers is on the line. He will be doing the presentation this evening. We will be a little bit longer than our other um, Q&A sessions, but it is going to be well worth your time. I hope you all have pen and paper ready and you have come with questions. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Kashan, and mute my microphone. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, first of all, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, greetings to those out there. Um, as I said, my name is Kashan Myers, and I am the executive director of an organization based out of Atlanta called Hopper Shot Incorporated, which stands for Help in Africa by Establishing Schools at Home and Abroad. And our organization is a pan African organization that cultivates youth leadership and youth in their families through five major areas, which are cultural education, sustainable agriculture, entrepreneurship, holistic health, and technology. And the main purpose behind, behind our organization is to reconnect people of African descent with their culture, their historical heritage, and to help in this repair process for all people of African descent. So we've chosen those ways of going about it. Um, since 2002, our organization has been functioning, and um, I have had the pleasure of being at the leadership um, for that time and seeing the growth of Habesha nationally and now internationally as our work has taken us to the African continent to continue as bridging these gaps and healing as we move forward. Um, I know everybody was on route, on mute, Raina, but I wanted to see if I could get a little feedback from some of the other people who are online or if there's a number of how many are online. Just get a few uh, questions. Really, I just wanted to ask who was online and um, and then if are there any particular things um, that, that they're interested in learning this evening. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm actually en route. I'm in D.C. I'm en route to a place where I can get internet connections. So right now, I'm talking via the phone, but I wanted to hear from some of the participants. If that's possible, Sister Rain, I know you, I think okay. you did yourself. But is that possible? <laughs> it is possible. Um, I will open up the mic and go down the line. Um, you all can introduce yourselves and um, Speak about what it is that you're interested in. If you don't speak, you can always type it into the question box or raise your hand. Um, Adrian, I'm going to start with you. You can just simply greet and then share what it is that you're looking to gain from the presentation. You're live. Okay, Ad Adrian. Hello. Hello. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, I, um, I'm a prologue teacher, um, and I teach uh, sustainability and uh, green construction to, um, to uh, underserved youth um, in Southside Chicago. And um, I would um, love to uh, hear more about sustainability um, as we're going to uh, start class um, this month. Okay. Give thanks. Good day. All right. The next person, Bella. Yes. Greetings, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, perhaps not. Oh, perhaps not. <laughs> um, let me go down. Somebody had a question. Ah, one of the Kambons. I don't want to say Mama or Baba uh, before I get it incorrect. There's a question. This is Mama. Yeah. Mama. Uh, no, I just wanted to welcome Kashan. Um, I've met him a couple of times. We were on a panel together and really interested in this project. Um, I really love um, Baba Kwe Kuando and work with him. And so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how this develops and at some point seeing if there's something I can contribute. Okay, greetings, Mama. How are you? Good to hear from you again. Yes, All right. Eric Jackson. Greetings.
I'll keep going down the line. Serena? <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, okay. And I'm pulling up at San Copa, so I should be ready in about two minutes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, if anybody has a, um, there we are, Ross Selassie. Here you are. Unmuted, brother. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, what's, uh, greetings, brethren. What's going on, brother? Uh, all is well. Um, I'm actually calling on behalf of HIM Institute of Higher Studies, located in uh, Shashamani. I believe you are up in, in Wonder Gannett with my uh, I Ross Adai, he sends his greetings from Ethiopia. What? What? Give thanks. Yeah, make sure you send Ross Adai my greetings. That's a blessing. Papa, I'm coming. Yes. yes. Sir. Wow. <laughs> yes. Sir. That that will be the that will be the first question. He couldn't he couldn't get online, so we we'll, we'll, we work the eyes work together. I was in Ethiopia myself. Um, but the one of the questions will be again uh, when when will be your next journey to Shashamani? Um, but the second will be. Because we also have a base also now in Ghana, the, the question would have been how we can actually inculcate some uh, intercontinental trade. You know, like I Majesty had mentioned about being able to maybe link Ethiopia to Ghana to Atlanta in you know, reference to trade, commerce in between, and how we can kind of build some you know economic empowerment with each with each other. Okay, give thanks. I'll, I'll be mentioning that in the presentation as well. Yes, I give thanks. All right, we have Mal Malachi. You're live. Malachi Israel. You had a question? I will um I'll read the question out. It says um he's a business owner of black body and hair products and wants to hear what this is all about. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Nita Robinson has a question as well. Nita, I'm going to unmute you. You're live. Nita. And she's muting her microphone. I don't know if she's <laughs> it's going in and out. I'll read your question. It says she's interested in composting, seed saving, the importance of non GMO foods for our people. Okay. All right. If anybody else has Arena, I'm I'm Go ahead. I just clicked on so I'm trying to open up right now for okay. the uh to get in. I okay. It should it should pop up on your screen and once it pops up, you all bear with us for a moment. Um once it pops up on your screen, um you should be asked to um there should be a link that you follow. And once you're on, I will see you pop up and I will change over the presenter details to you. Um, make sure that your screen is cleared off because everybody will be able to see your screen once you share it. Um, and we will go from there as you prepare to give us your phenomenal presentation this evening. Let me know um, what steps you're okay. going through and talk you through it. I'm on, um, it's asking me to click the launcher for the Citrix online launcher. Yes. Is that the right thing? That is correct. Okay. So it's doing that. Anybody else have those are some good questions. Anyone else have any more questions or want to introduce themselves while we get ready? Let's see. I'm gonna go back to the attendees and see. Anyone else? Charles, Adoya Faye, anybody have any questions? Wanna introduce themselves? Oh, I'll give thanks. Adoya Faye, your microphone is unmuted. Greetings. Uh, my name is Adoya Faye, and I would be interested in hearing about uh, sustainable practices such as growing my own food that can be done both here and on the continent, in particular in Ghana. Okay. okay. I think I I'm think in, Marina. Um, Wonderful. I see you. All right. I am going to turn it over to you. Okay, so okay. I just I just need to pull up my um, presentation so everyone can see it. Yes, you do. And did you hang up your cell phone? No, I'm hanging up right now. <laughs> All right, I need double feedback. Cell phone up, and it's asking me to uh, show. Okay, so can there you see you my are. screen now? We can see your screen. There you are. What can you 
can see the go to webinar control panel in the middle of my screen. Debbie, no, we can't see it. Um, you're you're good to go. Oh, okay. we, we won't be able to see that. You can only see that. Um, okay, perfect. All can right. Can everybody see and everybody? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we we're in the mix. So I give thanks. I would love to hear from anyone else who who is on the line. If you just want to introduce yourself briefly, that would be great. There's one hand that if just. If not, we'll get started. There's one more, and then we can get started. Sister Denise. Yes. Hey, Brother Kajan. This is Denise. Um, I'm in civil engineering, and ultimately, my area of focus is sustainable engineering or engineering sustainable communities. And I was, I'm interested in, because I've seen you been posting pictures and updates on Facebook, so I was interested in hearing about some of the progress. And just overall, what, like, and, and if you had to paint an overall picture of the final, what the final vision is, what, what, is, what, is, what is that for the, for the Institute? Okay, okay. Those are definitely some questions I'll go into. And I, I'll kind of get started just briefly again, reintroducing myself, um, you know, talking a little bit about the organization before I go into, you know, the Institute and this initiative that we're putting together. Um, some of you may know of our work. Um, we've been doing programs um, for youth in the metro Atlanta area and in the U.S. Uh, for about 10 years. One of our most well-known programs is called Black to Our Roots. And Black to Our Roots is a youth leadership and rights of passage program um, that focuses on community service fundraising and um, connecting our youth with their cultural heritage. Um, it started off as a year-long program in 2004 um, where we took five youth and two adults to Ghana, West Africa after going through this um, year-long rites of passage training. Um, now we have gone from doing it every year um, from 2004 to 2011 to now we do every two years and we've included both Ghana and Ethiopia in the travels and the youth um, study for two years reconnecting with the African cultural heritage and um, really rebuilding and repairing our relationships um, as African people throughout the diaspora. So we've been doing Black to Our Roots um, since 2004. Additionally and simultaneously, uh, particularly in the metro Atlanta area, we do a lot of work around urban agriculture, sustainability, and uh, and really connecting what, what we say is um, our culture, which the first culture is agriculture. And by the way, I'm actually here in Washington, D.C. Um, at the famous Sankofa Books and Cafe, if any of you you can do a hand raise on your screen, on your on your click if you've seen the film Sankofa. Um, well, I'm actually here with uh, at the the studio and cafe um, that Haile Garima and his wife Shira Kiana started in D.C. Um, had the pleasure of being with him, but I'm here for another meeting. So it's it's powerful that I'm here for that. And then actually, one of the uh, mottos that we say there's no culture without agriculture. I always tell people that's not my motto. One of our elders and teacher, Baba Tariq Oduno, is here. He's right actually downstairs as I was walking up here to, to get my computer situated. I saw him. So I honor him and I dedicate this to, to, to those who have been my teachers over the years to connect me with this work and to reclaim our, our cultural heritage as people of African descent. Um, so that's a little bit about, you know, Habesha. Like I said, we've been doing urban agriculture in Atlanta since 2003. Um, we have three main programs that we do. We do the Sustainable Seeds program is where we teach math, science, health, and nutrition to youth um, K through 8 mostly, some K through 12, um, but youth through the garden, through growing gardens, through growing food, eating nutritious plant-based foods, connecting with our cultural heritage um, through the food and understanding and overstanding why we use food as medicine. Um, additionally, we have a program that we started in 2011 called Habesha Works, which is a business training uh, program in urban agriculture for um, adults, where we're teaching adults about growing their food, but also the business opportunities that's available with that. Um, those who are in the Atlanta area, we are recruiting for that program. We'll start our new class in April, so if you're interested, definitely check out the Habesha website. And as of 2013, we started our newest initiative, where we're working with seniors, um, and we call that program Golden Growers. And what we're doing with our seniors is a little different because many of our seniors, particularly in the South, 
they grew up on farms. They are connected to the earth in many ways. But as they gotten older, you know, we go to senior centers and other places. They may not be as mobile. Um, so we bring opportunities for them to reconnect with the earth and to share and learn and to build. And, um, you know, just to commune with nature. Um, and we find that it helps with their quality of life, you know, as they're able to get out and be more active and have the therapy of growing food and caring and nurturing for something. So those are some of the initiatives that we do uh, with Habesha. Um, I literally about about 20 hours ago got back from Ghana, um, and so that's why I'm a little it, it, I'm a, it's a little disheveled. And I apologize for anybody who came on. I think Thursday I was supposed to be doing another presentation. I didn't have good internet access in Ghana, so I wasn't able to make it. Um, I'm going to go into the presentation now, and I want to start off by saying that this initiative really has been 10 years in the making. Um, and when I say that is because we we knew as an organization and me personally that we wanted to be able to do something of this initiative. The name is, of course, is, is not 10 years in the making, but the initiative is. Um, and it's a blessing that now we can see this, you know, come into fruition. And uh, as I think uh, Mama Cambon mentioned, um, the Institute is in honor of one of our great ancestors, uh, one of our great agricultural and botanical minds of the late 20th, 20th century, uh, Dr. Kwaku, A. Kwaku Ando. Um, I'll go briefly into him, but those who don't know about him, he, he was an ethnobotanist, born in Ghana from a family of ethnobotanists, um, very esteemed throughout the world, um, Europe, and U.S. and Africa for his work around medicinal plants and herbs using spiritual ceremonies and other activities. Um, he lived in the United States for about 30 years, first in the west coast of California, um, in San Francisco Bay Area, and then he moved to Atlanta where he started the North Scale Institute. That's where I met Dr. Ando and um, became one of his students in the work that he was doing. Um, Dr. Ando was very pivotal in bringing the plant Moringa to the United States back in the 80s. Um, even though he doesn't get the credit, and, I, and this is a plug too, if you're going to buy Moringa, um, support Mama Moringa, which is Dr. Ando's l line of Moringa products. So Mama Moringa, if you know of that one, support that. As Mama Kali is his uh, widow, she's continuing his legacy on. So we started this in, that, in, that, um, in the spirit of Dr. Ando and what he did. And we called it the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute because, you know, this whole concept of sustainability, I want to start there. You know, what I've seen, and when we do a lot of sharing with, with uh, our students, we talk about these concepts that we hear like sustainable, organic, you know, renewable, all of these quote-unquote new age concepts. In actuality, those concepts are our ancestors' concepts what has been done is people have taken those concepts, recoined them, and now turned them into a quote-unquote new concept, and now they're te telling us they're going to teach us how to be sustainable and teach us how to be environmentally friendly, teach us how to, you know, re recycle and renew and reduce and all of those things. In reality, we've always been practicing those things as people of African descent. Um, so I'll go a little bit into that, but I wanted to give some context just to um, you know, this whole discussion around sustainability and what it means is that it's nothing new for us. It's nothing new for us as African people. We've always been in tune with the earth. We've always knew that when we're in harmony with the earth, the earth is in harmony with us. So we've gotten out of harmony. We, we've come out of ourselves as African people and now we're returning with, San, with Sankofa. We're returning to the source. So this project and this initiative is really with that in mind. And so I'll go a little bit more into that later, but I want to just kind of start off with that. Um, so that people will be aware. Okay, let me see how I can click on to the next. All right, so a little bit about what we do. You can click some of the videos um, when you get a chance for those who can pull up the presentations. But I mentioned Habesha Works. I mentioned Sustainable Seeds. I also mentioned Black to Our Roots. And every year we have an event that we do called Organic Fest, which is a festival that really highlights and promotes people who are doing work um, around organic living, healthy living, active living, positive living for people of African descent. So these are some of the things that we've been doing. And since 2003, we've also hosted the Organic Fest with other um, organizations being in support. Um, thanks to Mama Nabantu and others who supported us over the years to make the Organic Fest a success. Um, the next page that you see is very powerful. 
um, you can read what it says, but if you look at this picture where you see this, this is a book to the left, written by a student, as you can see, Summer, who traveled with us in 2014. And when she came back, she wrote a book about her journey. Now, she traveled to both Ethiopia and Ghana. We spent 25 days, and we, we actually, our motto was 25K and 25 days. So literally, over a 25-day period in 2014, we had youth from Atlanta that's, that traveled 25,000 miles through land, air, and sea as a part of the Black to Our Roots program. Well, when Summer returned to the U.S. and she wrote her book, she wasn't aware that we were going to be launching Kazi, the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute, because we hadn't formalized it yet. But lo and behold, which I took as a sign from um, the creator and from the universe that we were in line, is that the picture that she chose to use for her book cover is the same picture that is the walkway um, and the, the road in the village where we're developing Kazi at. And that mountain you see um, in, the, in the background is Mount Afajito, which is Ghana's tallest mountain um, and is located in the village of Liatewote. So when Summer handed me a book that she had written, first of all, she didn't tell us that she was even going to do a book. It was like she wanted to surprise us. So that was a pleasant surprise to see that she had written her own book with the help, with the help of the Apex Institute in Atlanta, but also that the picture she chose to use was the picture in the village where we were going to be developing this institute. So I always want to just talk about alignment and how things work together. I thought that was very, very much aligned. Um, talking a little bit about this village, where we're going to be building at. Um, and like I said, for, for Habasha, we've been traveling to Ghana for the past over 10 years now, to, closer to 12 years. We've been traveling to Ghana, bringing youth, bringing adults, and reconnecting with our African ancestry and particularly connecting the young people with other youth because what we see is that the future is in their hands and as we can make the African diaspora and the Pan-African community closer through the use of internet and through the use of some of the other resources we have, you know, we're traveling more, this is going to be a very powerful resource. So um, this village where we're developing the institute is located in the Volta region of Ghana, which is, if you look on the map, it's the eastern most part of Ghana and actually Liate Wote it um, is on the border of Ghana and Togo um, near Lake Volta. It's also the country's farming region. Uh, farming is a major uh, um, um, a major um, industry in this particular region and particularly in the village of Liate Wote and the people maintain a lot of their traditional and ancient practices. One thing that's interesting about um, not only Liate Wote and not only Ghana, but many of many places on the continent and really wherever people of African descent are who, are who look to hold on to the African cultural heritage is that a lot of those cultural practices are being either lost because the younger generations many times are more attracted to, you know, quote unquote modern technology and, you know, advancement in that way. So that, that information is not being passed on generational. Um, and also, on the other side is that many times um, Europeans and other non-Africans are coming into these villages um, to take this information and to um, build on and from there they're rebranding it and saying it's their own. Um, so we find that happening that people, you know, as we've seen, you know, for centuries have taken our ideas, our intellectual property, used it and reclaimed it as their own. So we saw that there was a need for a, for a project to be for us and by us as people of African descent to reclaim. Um, so we chose Liate Wote because A, it's a farming region, B, it, the people there maintain a lot of their ancient traditions, and C, the village itself is very pristine. Um, as you can see, the village has Ghana's tallest mountain, but it, it also has a mountain range and it has the um, Tagbo waterfalls, which descends about 150 feet from the mountain range. So it has these natural wonders in the midst. Um, another thing that we loved about this particular village, Habasha has had a relationship with this village since 2005 when we were able to um, assist with bringing um, 
light to one of the clinics in the village. Um, so we've had a long relationship with this village. Anytime we travel to Ghana, it's always the last place that we travel. We ascend to the mountain and we enjoy our time there with the village. So we chose this as a space that really felt like home for us um, as an organization and, and those who've traveled there. You can see the view from atop a, a the mountain. This is a uh, this is Liate Wote, the village, um, very much still a small village, probably two to three hundred people at the most. Um, and you can see it's surrounded by greenery. Um, it's in a tropical climate and time area, so it gets a lot of rain during the rainy season. It stays green and lush. Any type of food that you can think of grows there very easily. So these are all reasons why we want to use this as really a, as, as a space to build and for us to be to share and continue the mission of Habesha. So um, we travel and ascend the mountain. I mentioned about the history. If you look at the picture up at the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but um, you'll see up at the left top right, there's a young brother in a blue shirt. He's shaking hands with someone in a traditional garment. That's the chief of the village, um, Tagbe Kadazi the fifth. Um, he's the chief who always welcomes us. And if you look down at the bottom, you'll see we're pointing up at the light that we actually have to help to bring into the clinic in 2007. Um, to the right, you'll see the letter of the, the divisional chief thanking us for what we've done. And the beautiful thing is our relationship has continued, you know, since this time and moved even further. So we've been there. It's not something where we come overnight and we're looking to, you know, teach, quote unquote, teach the people how to do things or uh, 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 civilize them. We're actually coming to share and to learn um, because I think us as Africans coming from the diaspora, along with our brothers and sisters on the continent, we have a lot to share and we have a lot to learn from each other. So that's why we're there and that's why we've chosen this, this space as our space for us. Um, just uh, some of the sceneries that you can see from the particular village. Um, one thing that's very fascinating, hopefully this will come up. Let's see. Are you able to see this? Is the video, is the video playing? I'm there, yes. Okay. So this is Tagbo Falls. You can see and pristine waterfalls that goes into this beautiful pool where you can swim, get a nice water massage. Um, it's a part of the holistic healing components that we'll have. The water from this particular um, falls actually flows to the back of the land where we'll be building the institute. So we actually are getting water, fresh water from Tagbo um, on the land where we'll be building the institute at. So I'm very, very excited about that. And again, this is Mount Apajito, Ghana's tallest mountain. This is always a great um, test for the young people. They love to see who can reach at the highest. So up to this point, 28 minutes is the, the quickest that actually the group from 2014, a few of the young people were able to make it up. Before then, it was 41 minutes. So they keep wanting to top each other who can make it up the quickest. But um, we climb the mountain and get have this breathtaking view of the scenery for miles and miles away um, that really is refreshing, particularly for these young people who mostly live in cities. They've never been to mountains. They've never seen this kind of greenery. So it just gives them a whole other perspective on life, um, I think so. Um, I talked a little bit about Dr. Ando, um, and this just gives you a little more information. But what I can really say, if you see the picture to the top left, very interesting picture for a few reasons. One, the plant that Dr. Ando is holding up is the Moringa plant. Um, this picture was taken in, in Ghana in 2009. Um, Dr. Ando passed in 2011, and before he passed, he was actually developing a, uh, a, a research and training farm in Cape Coast, um, Ghana, where he was bringing in plants and herbs from all over the world to study. And so we, saw, we met him, and the group of the youth met him then, and he shared with us some of the work that he was doing and also inspired us, um, particularly the young people, because of the passion that he had with what he was doing. And I love that picture because Dr. Ando, of course, if you look on, on his head, he's wearing a Malcolm X hat. So he's representing Malcolm X, you know, in Ghana and doing some powerful, powerful work. So he was really a great inspiration to us in Atlanta um, for the work that he did at the North Scale Institute and for the research that he's been doing for the past 50 years around particularly medicinal herbs coming out of Western Africa. Um, so what we wanted to do as we develop the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute was really to honor him and his work and to continue that work. Um, so not only using his name, you know, for namesake for the Institute, but much of the research that he had started and continuing to do 
um, even up to his transition, we want to begin to further that research. Um, he comes from a line of ethnobotanists. His father was a botanist. Um, so he and one of his greatest inspirations was George Washington Carver. Um, a quick story about Dr. Ando, Mama Kali, his wife, who's still in, in Atlanta, she told me that um, she always would tell Dr. Ando that he was the reincarnate of George Washington Carver. And what he said, she said was that uh, George Washington Carver, I think, passed um, in 1943, and Dr. Ando was born in 1943. So she would always say literally that the spirit that George Washington Carver had for the work he did passed on to Dr. Ando. And if you went to Dr. Ando's office at the North Scale Institute, you would see pictures of George Washington Carver everywhere as his inspiration. So we're really just continuing again this line of those who come before us who, who have really um, moved our people forward in different ways. And we've chosen this as one of, of our ways to move the work forward that Dr. Ando has been doing. Um, this is the pictures from 2009 in Ghana. We're meeting with Dr. Ando and some of the youth and adults that travel with us um, to meet with him, to learn from him, and to build. So very, very much excited about that. Um, a little bit about the institute, as we call it, Kazi. And um, the main components, as you can see, the, the three pillars are sustainable infrastructure development, organic agriculture, and holistic healing. And I'll be going into those. Um, I heard someone earlier ask about, uh, the sister said she was a civil engineer, and she was asking about some of the buildings and developments. Um, we want to be able to use as much of our ancient technologies as possible uh, when it comes to infrastructure and design. Um, the village of Liate Wote for us has one of the most sustainable resources found on earth. It's very plentiful. That resource is bamboo. Um, for those who know a little bit about bamboo, it, it's a very sustainable resource. It reaches its full development and maturity within two to three years. Um, so it grows very plentifully um, and can be used for fuel, food, um, textiles, building, um, so many uses for bamboo. So that will be a pillar in what we're doing. Additionally, we will also be utilizing um, the natural soil that's in um that's in Liate Wote to use um, to make what we call mud bricks um, using the natural earth. Um, some people call them, you know, earth and homes or whatever. Um, but interestingly enough, as I go, as I as I talk about how this whole concept of, of sustainability and many of these concepts that our ancestors um, used were naturally sustainable and naturally environmentally friendly, you know, what we're building, which they call mud brick homes now. Um, and they're, you know, they're becoming a phase here. Many people hear the crazy. Here. Many people hear about the earth bags and other um, type of homes where they're using earth and materials. Well, you know, I remember when I was younger, you know, if you tell people you want to, you know, live in a mud brick home, they would think that you were primitive. You're living in a mud hut. You know, you're backwards. Nowadays, people are seeing these mud brick homes and earth bags and these various ways of, of building sustainably as really the future and it's really more quote unquote fashionable now. Um, but again, what's happened is it's been taken out of the African context and put into a more European quote unquote modern context so that our ancestors aren't given the credit of what they were doing. Um, Latrite, L-A-T-E-R-I-T-E, -E, is a type of soil that is found in Liate Wote and found in a lot of Ghana that can be used for um, mud, home, mud brick buildings. And latrite is very good because it actually um, can hold just as long as concrete, um, but however, it has more beneficial uses. For instance, when you build with earthen homes, it keeps your home cooler during the hot hot days and warmer during the cold or cooler days. So it has its own natural air conditioning elements when built correctly. Um, if anybody's been to Ghana, I can't speak about other African continents, but they have these huge mounds, these red, big red mounds that are like, um, if you look at them, you think there's some type of structure that people have put together, but they're actually, um, they're, they're insects, they're termite type insects where they built these, basically over here we see the little anthills. These are six, seven, eight, ten feet by five, six, seven, eight, ten feet wide um, homes that they built that are hard as a rock. And what they're using is the soil 
mixed with their saliva and other elements of the earth to build these homes. So what our ancestors did when they were building these quote-unquote mud huts, they mimicked what they saw in nature. They built the homes similar to what they saw the termites or the ants build. And by doing that, they were in tune with nature. They didn't have to destroy nature. So from an infrastructure development component, that's what we want to utilize for Kazi. We want to be able to mimic nature and mimic what's already present for us and use the resources there. So um, the earth will be a, a main resource for us, the soil, also the bamboo. Um, we'll be using a lot in our infrastructure development, in our furniture making, in our roof building. Um, we'll be using all of these elements that are found locally right in the in the village of Liatiwote and specifically you know in the country of Ghana. Um, organic agriculture is another important and critical component. Um, as many of us may know that Monsanto is not our friend. Um, and as we here in the diaspora, and particularly in the U.S., are becoming more and more conscious of the dangers of Monsanto, they're taking their act abroad, and they're going to the continent of Africa. And what they want to do now is to be able to take over the food sources of Africa, and particularly around the seeds. Um, so many of these um, companies like Monsanto and other biotech companies are going into Africa and they're offering aid, but many times aid comes with strings attached. And so what they're doing is they're saying, hey, we'll give you aid, but in order to get this aid, you have to accept these Monsanto seeds. You have to accept, um, you know, whatever the biotech field is bringing in. What that's doing is two things. One is, it's first of all, destroying the indigenous seed population. Um, so that now many of the indigenous strands of food that were grown are close to being obsolete because the introduction of these other seeds, particularly corn, um, throughout West Africa and really throughout Africa, corn is a major crop using quite a few dishes. Um, but what's happening is with, with companies like Monsanto, they'll plant corn and then their corn cross-pollinates with the indigenous corn and basically destroys the indigenous corn. Uh, Monsanto has also been suing companies and suing individuals who have farms that um, cross-pollinate with the GMO corn, and they're suing them and taking over their farms. So it's a hostile takeover. So we know that organic agriculture and maintaining heirloom and good quality seeds is very important. And so as I again go back to the, these these terms, sustainable, organic, these are new terms. Organic is nothing new. Um, our ancestors have always knew to use the best natural seeds and the best practices that are not harmful to the environment. So what we're doing is we're just reclaiming many of these technologies that our ancestors have used for thousands of years that may be getting either pushed to the side by newer generations coming up or taken over by those who are coming in to, to steal our intellectual property and we're reclaiming those. Um, another major component of the um, institute will be holistic healing. Um, we know that as a people, A, we need healing um, in many ways, mental, physical, spiritual, and otherwise. The beautiful thing about Dr. Ando, he's done a lot of work on holistic healing, particularly around plants and herbs. So we're going to be continuing those, that research that Dr. Ando has done around many of the, the herbs that are healing for us to help us with, with our issues that we have as a people, both in all of those areas of health. Um, we'll be using this through developing, the first phase is our four acre site in Liatewote. On this site, um, we will have trainings, we will have lodging for those who are interested in coming and learning. We will have opportunities for um, what we're calling residencies for those who want to come for an extended period of time and learn about the initiatives and practices that we're doing. And we will also have opportunities for groups, um, both youth and adults who want to come, to see what we're doing to learn, to build, and to get an idea of how to maintain and sustain communities in a positive way. Um, one thing that I'm excited about what we'll be doing um, is that many brothers and sisters from the U.S. and the diaspora are interested in repatriating um, to Africa and returning. We are creating what we're calling the incubator program which is a six month training, six to 12 month training where people who are interested can come to the institute, learn the components of Kazi, in addition, learn the local languages, um, use 
use whatever skill sets they have to benefit the community and the country itself. And after this six to twelve month time where they've learned the language, learned these skill sets, and been able to travel and see Ghana and know which areas connect with them, this is a launching pad for them now after that six to twelve month period to be able to, you know, live and either choose a piece of land that they want to um, you know, purchase or access or have some way to transition into actually living in Ghana. So we are creating this institute as really as a hub uh, for knowledge sharing both Africans on the continent and Africans in the diaspora in a way that what we call a sacred space. This space is for us by us. Um, it's not something where we're inviting you know Europeans in and we're unapologetic about that that this is for us, this is by us, and we will be in control of this because we need our own sacred spaces. So we're creating this space that we can use as a bridge between Africans on the continent and, and the diaspora. Um, I'll go into a little more a more about some of the components again in a second. This again is now, if you can see, if you look back to the, uh, the book, you can see this is now the mountain, and this is the road. Anyone who's traveled here, this, this is an iconic road. If you look to your left and your right, you're going to see bamboo on both sides of the road. Um, and that's bamboo that, that is harvested for um, using for fencing, using for building and otherwise. But it's so plentiful. Sometimes I tell people, sometimes I tell people that, um, you know, when you have resources right under your nose, you don't appreciate them as much. Um, and what I mean by that is, Bamboo is considered, really kind of considered in Liatewote and all over Ghana, more so as the poor, the poor man's wood. If you don't have wood to build or create a fence, you use bamboo uh, because it's so plentiful. And so just on an interesting side note, when I was just left Ghana and we were in Liatewote, um, we'll, we'll be developing with some of the youth in the village um, crafts and designs that can be used, uh, that can be built using bamboo. So we want to create an economic viability um, opportunity for the youth of the community to, to use this, uh, this resource that grows naturally in their village that they can make all kind of crafts with. So I showed them a short video of some of the things that are being made with bamboo from furniture to houses to even clothing and they were you know amazed and inspired um, to see that this resource that they have and take for granted people all over the world are oohing and on over it because of its value in it because of its use. And so what happens again, um, I think for us and anyone who's been to the continent, you know, the West has such a draw um, for, for nations that are, are um, not as developed from, a, from an economic and um, infrastructural perspective. You know, people want to come to the Europe, to the Europe, come to the U.S. There's a draw. And so us as Africans who are coming from the West, we actually have an opportunity to influence in a positive way. And what I mean by that is that when we come from the West and we talk about the value of bamboo, it makes those brothers and sisters who actually have these resources, it, it makes them feel a little prouder because they can they, they feel like, wow, we have the knowledge of this. We may not have have utilized it as much as we could, but it makes them, you know, hold their chest up a little higher to know that, you know what, there are people who have value the things that we have because for so long Africa has been under um, value and um, you know underdeveloped in many ways so we're coming to reverse this trend um, we're coming to reverse this trend this right here is is a basic rendering of of the Institute for phase one if you can look at some of the, the legend you can see some of the designs that we we'll have and I'll, I'll show you some components later um, this is kind of a basic general guide what we're actually doing is right now we have some of the youth who have traveled to Ghana and been to Liatewote through the Black to Our Roots program. Uh, we have one youth in particular, Jema, he's an artist. So we're having him, we gave him this general template and now he's actually creating the design for the spaces and what the, the buildings and infrastructure will look like because we wanted to have our youth on this side incorporated in the design as well as our brothers and sisters um, in Liatewote to be a part of it. Um, but ideally, somebody saying something? That this is a fear. Um, there are quite a few questions that are coming in. I'm going to let you finish your thought, but I did want to find out if you'd rather take questions. Um, would you have me interrupt you to take questions, or would you uh, have me wait until the end? It is 6:59. Um, 
thought I would just let you know. Tell me how long I have to. I would like to definitely take questions. I, I can speed up this part and then we can ask more questions. Or... Well, the, good, the good news is there's nobody else after you. So um, it depends on whenever people are ready to go home and sign off. Okay. But, we have, um, but I want to be respectful of your time, too. So there are questions that have come in. And I didn't know when to stop you because you have such great information, but I, I didn't. I'm, I'm, I can run my mouth all day. Trust me. I, <laughs> I kind of got on the roll now. So let me just run my mouth for like five more minutes and then you stop me and then we can go to questions. Okay, right? go ahead. I'm going to put um, them down in the chat box too, just in case it makes it faster. Okay. You okay. Yeah. Talk. What I'll do is when I finish, I'll be able to go. I'm kind of just focusing on the presentation now so um, I can ramble on. But I, I wanted you to just get a general idea. So... And I want to say, I'll say this, and then I'll kind of, how we want to, the, the, the vision behind the Institute, and this is phase one, but the vision behind it is this will be a hub where brothers and sisters from the continent and brothers and sisters from the diaspora can come together to learn, to share, to build, and to heal. Um, and so this campus that we're creating is not uh, a permanent residence. As I mentioned, we'll have incubator um, lodging for people. Um, but we'll have actually kind of three levels of lodging. We'll have, if you look to the right, you'll see some circular buildings, and, and you'll see the, you can see the legend as well. Those are what we're calling chalets or the circular um, earthen homes. Um, we have some that will have two-bedroom, and we have some that will be studio. Um, we also have what we call a guest house. Um, and any people who travel to Ghana or other parts of West Africa will know that many times when you're traveling in versus hotels, people have what they call guest houses, which means that it may be one house that people um, have rooms that they rent out. So we'll have guest houses for people to come and they can, um, you know, stay on a, on a short-term basis if they're passing through or we have different events. And then we also have um, camping facilities um, where people who want to be at a camp, we'll have tents and things of that nature where people can camp and, um, you know, begin to, to um, gain this experience of being in this space. Um, Towards the road, you'll see there's a circular building, and of course, we have panels. One of the, one of the components that we're bringing in that um, um, we're using is solar panels. Um, what we're looking to do is actually we're working right now to, to be able to build solar panels locally using the resources um, in Ghana. Um, and we're also working with some brothers and sisters out of Atlanta um, called Direct Sun. It's a black-owned solar power company. Um, we're, we're looking to partner with them as well. So we'll be bringing those elements in. But in the front will be a, like a community pavilion where we'll have the events, activities that we can share. One of the things that we want to do to be able to reconnect um, Africans on the continent, with, particularly with the African experiences in America, is we want to begin to have film showcases and movie nights that we show, kind of like Screen on the Green, where we bring the community together and we have films that we can both um, continental films and also diaspora films that tell our stories, whether they be films like Sankofa, whether they be documentaries, or whether they be African films that tell a story, where we can come together and showcase films and have discussions about it um, to begin this healing. And then we have some areas for recreation uh, where we can, you know, get our, get our, our, our um, physical activity on, learn, share, and build. And so the idea is to have where people can come through, but we will also actually have um, retreats and summits that we will hold on the campus um, where we want to bring in the likes of Dr. Sabi and the Queen of Fools, where people can come in for detox retreats and holistic healing retreats, utilizing the mountain and utilizing Tagbo waterfalls as well well as a part of this holistic healing and being in this kind of natural environment. So I'm going to move a little quicker. I talked a little bit about some of the components, but you can see to the left, the picture is uh, of one of the circular homes. This is actually a template that we'll be using as well from One Africa, which is in Cape Coast, Ghana, run by a repatriate, um, Mama Aymakus, and her son, Shabazz. Um, they built a beautiful space. If you ever go to Ghana, make sure you support and go to One Africa. But we'll be using a lot of technologies that our ancestors know of, the thatch roofs. You know, something like this, if you saw something like this, you know, years ago, People will tell you, oh, people living in mud huts. They, why would you want to live there? But nowadays, they just built in Atlanta. They have a, at Sweetwater Creek, they have yurts. This yurt is basically the same circular structure, but they've called it a yurt now to make it as if it's a nice fancy name to take the technology that our ancestors have been doing because they built in these circles because they knew that the circle is the cycle of life. So it wasn't just coincidence that it's in a circle. They knew what they were doing, and they knew how to build these thatched roofs to where the roofs absorb 
the water and they ran the water off naturally. So they had a way of insulating themselves, they had a way of protecting themselves using the environment around them. And that's really what we want to model after. Additionally, as I talked about the healing, we want to have spaces where we can come together, where we can do comedic yoga, where we can do Reiki, breathing, all of these ancient traditions that are ours. So we want to be able to do trainings then. We want to bring in some of the top people world, world renowned both from the continent of Africa and also throughout the diaspora to come and share and come and build. And the idea is I mentioned about a residency program. Um, when we um, get our site fully developed, we want to be able to every year have two to three young people from Ghana and two to three young people from the U.S. that come in for year-long residencies where they get training on all of these components, very intense training, where we bring them in to do this residency and they learn and now a part of what they're learning to do is to share this with others. Um, we, the component, we, we haven't gotten a name for it yet, but what we're doing is, um, it, it really is the, the, it's taking what something like the Peace Corps wanted to do but really is not doing for us. So these um, people can come in, you can get training, learn, take that training out and share with others in the community and also now take what you've learned and go on, you know, whether it's in, on, in Ghana or other places in the continent or other places throughout the diaspora where you can take what you've learned through this 12-month training period. Um, the first three months will be where you're learning from those who are on the ground. The second three months will be where you participate in helping to manage the space. And the last three months, you'll be training someone else who will come in and replace you. So we want to have various programs simultaneously going on that creates this hub for people of African descent. Um, and then organic agriculture, that's something we do here with Habasha Works. Um, we're looking to do similar programs there. We actually um, are also currently right now actually building our satellite site, which is in um, the eastern region of Ghana. It's a smaller, it's actually about a half an acre where we'll have a guest house and we'll be doing some organic gardening at the space. But even larger than that, we have a relationship with the Aubrey Botanical Gardens, um, one of three major botanical gardens in Ghana that we are going to be working with to train and, and develop young people to grow organically um, and to use the natural practices that our ancestors have used. Um, and also bringing opportunities for um, different crops and products that um, are there but not as, as plentiful or used as much. For instance, in Ghana right now, when you travel down many of the roads, you're going to see neem growing like palm tree, like uh, pine trees growing in Georgia. Neem, if anyone's familiar with neem, N-E-E-M. It's a healing plant, a blood cleanser. They use it a lot to cure malaria. It's growing so plentifully. And uh, it's not it's used but not used as much. Um, we want to be able to make sure we can create value-added products out of neem. Aki, many of you in the Caribbean may know of Aki. They use it a lot of time in dishes. It's growing very plentiful but not used. So there's a lot of things that are around that are not being used, and we want to re-tap into these things. And a lot of it happens because, again, the same way that slavery and Jim Crow affected people of African descent in America, colonialism and neocolonialism affected Africa. So we both have a lot of healing to do, and we don't want to lose this indigenous ancient knowledge. It's, the Europeans are coming for it. They want this knowledge. And our brothers and sisters, they want to be able to share and learn at the same time if we're not the ones doing it, and they others are coming and offering support for them, they're going to you know, by all means, you know, share and give those who are offering the support opportunities to come in. Um, just happens that those people who come in a lot of times, the Europeans don't have a good intentions. So we need to come with the right intentions, not with a European mind state, just in the African skin. Um, so that's part of what we're doing. And that's why it's taken us 10 years to really develop this because we wanted to do it the right way. We didn't want to rush. And now we're in a position where we can. This right here is a prototype. Um, of what we'll be building in, in Liate Wote. Um, it's a combination of the circular home with an extra story upstairs for sitting, relaxing, and enjoying the view. So we'll be building these and where you see the columns, that'll be bamboo doors and all of the other components will be a combination of bamboo as well as the um, latrite earth, um, earthen materials. This is a brother who lives in Ghana I'm just going to play this, and um, but he's talking a little bit about what he does. If I mute it, can you still hear me? If I mute Mike, can you still hear me as I mute I'm my... Not, um, go ahead and try it, and then I'll let you okay. know. You still hear me. 
But I just wanted you to see he he's developed his own thing. He's just kind of solo off the grid, but this is what he's doing. I'll play it so maybe you can hear it. And what are you run, yeah, what are you running off of that? Just like, you know, sound system, okay. lights. I got nice. efficient light bulbs. Nice. You know, you got like a, I get like 60 watt light, but you only use your channel budget with them. Mm. You got 75 watt lights and it's just 20. So, you know, everything. Any there. type of refrigeration or anything that's yeah, a I got a gas high energy? I got a gas fridge. A gas fridge? Ah. Okay, so that's more efficient than um. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. Is, is that more efficient? That's All right, so I'm going to move on. This picture right here is actually on the land where we're building cars in. If you looked in the background, you'll see nothing but bamboo. Um, so this gives you an idea. And in the background is the river that runs from the falls onto our land. The brother who's sitting next to me is Mousy. He's a brother who is well respected in the community. He is a mason, he's a carpenter, um, and he is basically the person who brought us into the village. And just recently when I came back, I was actually just um, received as a, as a child of the village. And so Mousy is, is, is my village father. So they had a ceremony for me, welcoming me and the Habasham family officially as members of um, the Liate Wote village family. So it was a beautiful ceremony. And this is where we'll be building. We begin to clear. Um, development will begin in 2000, in um, July of this year. Um, but we've already started clearing. So we'll be beginning our development with the idea that by summer 2016, we begin development. And 2018, um, spring, summer 2018, we'll complete phase one of the development. Um, Sister Raina, I know my time. I can talk more. I got a few more slides. But I think. Maybe even as I'm, the questions come up, then I can touch on some of the other slides, but I want to definitely get to the questions and be mindful of everyone's time. So if there's a way you want to organize the questions, feel free. I'm open, and then I can add more to my presentation as we uh, as we talk. But I definitely want to get um, the attendees on. Is It It okay. says I see 26 out of 101 attendees. What does that mean? 26 people are on? Or 26, 26 people are on right now that have microphones. They're on and they're available. Hands are going up, and I have... If you go down to the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a chat box. I started pasting the questions in there. There are some conversations that Mama Nobantu and I had. Please don't read those. <laughs> uh oh, oh, oh. Um, get in your business. No, no, it's nothing. It's nothing deep. Um, but as you're looking for that, I would like to say um, we are looking forward to having the Black Sustainability Summit be something annual and eventually have it in a physical location and you just went on ahead and volunteered 2018 so thank you so much i'll yeah. let you get back yeah. to taking yeah. your <laughs> I, yo i love it and family reunions we want to do it all we actually are facilitating groups and um, we'll facilitate our first college group this year we were doing high school students but um we've actually now worked with my alma mater florida and m university and one of my professors um dr huberta jackson loman we're going to be facilitating a, a college group this uh this summer, and we're excited about that opportunity to facilitate HBU students as well as Black Study students, um, and particularly around Indigenous knowledge. So I'm excited. Wow. So should I just read the questions off, or how, tell me what's the best way to do it? You can, um, you can just say their name, and then well, I'll go ahead and read the question, and then you can um, you can answer it. Um, okay. It's um, one is coming from Mama Mausi. Uh, would you consider selling bamboo seeds so that you can grow it in your sacred um, spaces? Well, what we'll do is, you know, how bamboo works, for those who don't know, bamboo is really like a grass. Um, and so the best, the best way that I've seen um, to, to, to propagate bamboo is bamboo has shoots that grow. So many, many times what you can do is similar to like uh, peppermint and other herbs that has roots that run um, horizontal. You can cut off com ends of roots and they'll you can sprout those roots bamboo is literally like grass it grows if you you know people who have grass and you try to dig grass out of somewhere and the next thing you know the grass pops up again in between concrete bamboo is very resilient like that it's in the grass family so um, definitely on site we'll have um, you know seedlings that can be used and sold as well as products that we'll make out of bamboo um, you know 
unfortunately, the as far as traveling with seeds and any kind of agricultural products, it's becoming more and more um, hard to do to, to travel internationally because of U.S. customs and all of those things related to that. They become very strict on what you can take different places. Um, but we definitely will be creating seed banks and having a nursery on site where we'll have many of the plants that we're growing that people can take with them and use and build. So that's a part of what we're doing is to, to have this indigenous seed bank because, you know, um, over here we're not really eating an African diet. Um, a, we're tropical people. We're supposed to be eating, you know, um, more fruits, more more things that have a, a, a tropical, um, that come from a tropical time zone. However, we also are supposed to be eating seasonally, right? So right now I'm in D.C. and I'm seeing um, five foot uh, five foot piles of snow everywhere, which tells me that not much is growing in D.C. So eating seasonally in places like this is hard because you would starve if you were to truly eat seasonally in D.C. because ain't nothing growing. Um, but we can try to eat as close to what our ancestors ate, and so those are some of the things that we'll be doing. And it's a lot of indigenous products that um, we'll be growing that many people don't know of, but they should know of. Um, some people might have heard of soursop, right? Um, if you Google soursop online, it they it is saying that soursop can help cure cancer, right? Um, they have another dish in Ghana called contumbre, which is the green leaf. It's also a yam. It's a cocoa yam. Kind of. I always think of it when I when I first heard of contumbre. I thought of turnips because you know in in the south we have turnip greens and you eat the turnip green root but you can also eat the turnip green leaves so contumbre is what is grown in Ghana and they eat the greens and they eat the leaves so we'll be having those products um, on site and of course those who are in Ghana and want to you know have seeds and get seeds will have those who want to travel internationally we have to talk about that offline because there are some ways but we don't want to tell all of our business um, through the internet okay next question good thanks um the next question um and i have somebody on the line who has their hand raised so i will turn on their microphone um after i read through the next four questions um davis asks would you be looking to use the commercial method to process the bamboo to make the different products in the future well interestingly enough um when i was just there and i was talking with the brothers um as we were sitting and i was showing them the bamboo video they gave me a big homework assignment. Um, my homework assignment is to, I've already began to do this, but I'm really, over the next six months, uh oh, over the next six months, um, I'm going to be intensively studying, and I already have a few people that, that are advising me on it, the most natural ways of preserving bamboo, um, because there are some, you know, chemical methods, but there are also some natural methods. So part of what we're doing is researching. Um, the, the best uses for bamboo and some of the traditional methods are there um, but we're looking at traditional methods because there's another place that uses bamboo a lot is in um, places like Bali, Malaysia, places in the Pacific, Pacific, Asia Pacific so we're looking at some of their techniques and practices that they've used to sustain and, and um, preserve bamboo and those are some of the things that we want to be able to do but we want to keep it as as natural and close to nature as possible so that it can be used, it can be done with the resources that are found, you know, either um, in Liate Water itself or at least local enough where we can access because one of the main components of sustainability is that you don't have to go outside of your community, your environment, or your local area to to utilize the resources that you need to survive. We, we don't want to say we're being sustainable, but then we got to go purchase parts from you know, China or somewhere to quote unquote be a sustainable. So we're going to use the methods and techniques that are most easily readable, re readily available for those in those environments. And that's what we'll be learning and sharing. So I have a big assignment um, and I'm doing a lot of research um, on um, how to preserve and utilize bamboo um, from a long term perspective based on the environments because when you're in tropical environments there are certain elements that you have to consider when you're in drier cooler environments there are certain elements you have to consider so that's some of the work that we're going to be doing and so anyone who's an expert in bamboo who or who's interested in helping me with some homework assignments I, I definitely would love to help um, we're excited about it wonderful <laughs> good thanks um, Adrian asks how has your program 
and sustainability been used as a platform to promote and nurture local young black entrepreneurship? That's a beautiful question. Um, one of the main things we've done is we created this program called Habesha Works in 2011. And since 2011, we've been able to train about 60 people of African descent, um, young adults and some um, more seasoned adults, um, but, but mostly young people, teaching them about urban agriculture and more specifically focusing on the business aspects of urban, of urban agriculture and focusing on entrepreneurship. And when we say urban agriculture, people think, don't, sometimes people only think urban agriculture means growing your food and taking it to a farmer's market and selling it. But we, we, we debunk that myth. Um, urban agriculture is so much more. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a sis in Atlanta called Honeysuckle Moon. She has a, a line of products that I use. And her king man, Brother Charles, is one of the, uh, is a part of the Habesha leadership team. Well, she has shea butter products. She has bath oils and bath salts. She has um, other type of blends that she uses for hair and skin. Well, guess what? The products that she uses in her, um, I mean, the ingredients that she uses in her products um, come from plants. Many of the plants can be grown in an urban environment, like lemongrass. She has a lemongrass product. You can grow lemongrass in Atlanta. You can grow lemongrass in many places. That becomes actually, that's a part of urban agriculture. Um, Value-added products are a part of urban agriculture. So, for instance, I tell people what value-added product means is you can grow a tomato, an onion, a pepper, and garlic. You can grow those things and take them to a farmer's market and sell them. That's one way, right? But you can also take those same ingredients and blend them up, package it in a bottle, put a label on it, and you have some fresh organic salsa. That becomes a value-added product. That means that's something that you created that brings more to um, economic revenue to you based on you, you know, creating an additional value for it. Um, other components of that are creating essential oils. Um, you know, we can grow peppermint and we can sell peppermint, but we can also distill peppermint and make peppermint oil, which we know essential oils are very precious. Um, so those entrepreneurial opportunities have been there. We've had many of our trainees that have gone on to either start their own farms, do their own um, line of products, and also introducing them into the industry where they've either gotten employment in the field and been able to do their own thing. Brother Tenicio Cianema, if any of you know Tenicio, he has Nature's Candy Farm. He's um, one of our students. We have uh, Brother Ed Wood who has Gumbo Gardens. Um, Fresh to Health is another organization that does a lot of work around urban agriculture. So we're really about promoting entrepreneurship, really about promoting these skills of where we can feed ourselves and create this network to where we become dependent on each other and creating our own communities as what we call food security or food sovereignty. Beautiful. I fully agree. Um, we are coming up on time and I would I would love to keep it running, but I actually have I'm out of town as well <laughs> and I have um, I'm going to have to run. But you all have I'm going to open up the line for Angela because she's had her hand up. Adoya Faye and um, a few others. The, the questions are in the chat for you. Um, Kashan, I'm going to take um, this one caller and have her come in and then allow you to answer the next questions as I'm getting ready. And then I'm going to have to end the session. Please go to the schedule page on BlackSustainabilitySummit.com and follow the instructions to reach out to Baba Kashan. Um, and we will make sure that you all stay connected. Um, let me go ahead and turn it over to Adrian, uh, to Angela. Excuse me, Angela, you're, you've been unmuted. Angela, I actually do not have a question. It was oh. a great session. No question. So obviously. I did not. There. Is my hand down? Your hand is down. I'm going to turn it over to Ishtam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ishtam, you're unmuted. Or you've muted your own phone one way. Okay. Maybe she didn't mean to do it either. I'm going to go ahead and um, take Ross Selassie has his hand up as well. Greetings, brother. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Greetings, brother. How are you doing? Again. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I have a couple of questions, but I'll just run them off, you know, just as we're reasoning. Um, I, uh, questions would, would be, uh, how can 
repatriate, okay, get citizenship in Ghana, uh, what are you making at, uh, at the institute and that could be utilized for trade and again I mentioned earlier how can we build the trade links uh, between Ghana, Ethiopia and the diaspora. Uh, the, last part, the, the last part would be actually having to do with uh, collective land purchases in Ghana from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, of any programs that you know of that people are coming from the West that actually can get collective land in Ghana so when they come across and repatriate, they can repatriate to their own collective, you know, land that they can work and settle together. You understand? Yes, yes. And you, you some real good questions. Um and again I didn't get a chance to go through all of the presentation, I'll just share more. Um the first question about um the dual citizenship, um <clears throat> that's something that's a progress process a process in motion. Um, Mama Aimakus, which I mentioned earlier, she's been in Ghana for about 30 years right. and I actually just met with her and she gave me some information about um, dual citizenship. It is possible um, to get dual citizenship. What's happened right now in Ghana that they had this whole initiative called the, the Joseph Project which was um, modeled to, to encourage um, particularly those who were of Ghanaian ancestry who had left Ghana to return. Um, and so that that was a whole component of dual citizenship. However, many of the Africans from the diaspora have been pushing to broaden that scope of what dual citizenship looks like because many of them say, well, we, you know, we weren't necessarily born in Ghana or we can't trace our lineage back to Ghana, but we know that our ancestors were taken from um, you know the western coast and we want to be able to re-enter so that's been a push and honestly it fluctuates based on the political party um, when President Rawlings was in he was very supportive this was in the, the 80s and 90s he was supportive of that um, it hasn't gotten as much momentum in the past few administrations um, however there is an ongoing push now to allow dual citizenship um, to come in. Um, Rita Marley who has a base in Ghana, um, Bob Marley's widow, she just received her dual citizenship um, to Ghana. So it's it's a slow trickle, um, but there are some requirements. For instance, um, you have to be in the country for at least five years. <coughs> you have to have some type of business or doing some development that contributes to the country. Um, and there are a few other requirements, but I actually just got the documentation from Mama Aimaku. So that's something that we will actually be looking to share more. Um, there is an African American Association of Ghana, and there's also the, Diafrica, the Diaspora Africa Forum that is headed by Dr. Erica Bennett. Um, she is a, basically has a diplomatic mission for the AU, so she's kind of like the, the, the AU branch of the diaspora, if you will. Um, she's, she's doing work around that as well. They're actually in... Um, in Ethiopia right now for economic summit, her and some others like um, um, Dr. Desta Magoo, who's also doing a lot of good work in Ethiopia. You probably know of Mama Desta. I know she's Shashimani a lot. She's the one who brought us to Ethiopia. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, um, we actually have a product line that we just um, just begin to promote here in Atlanta. We we have a line of liquid black soap that is made in Ghana. Um, there's a brother who is a repatriate. Um, who's been living in Ghana since 2000 and who actually received us when we first came um, has been developing this product using um, coconut oil and the cocoa pod developing an all natural product so we actually now have um, our, our own line of um, black soap, liquid black soap that we are um, looking to promote and really this will be the first kind of component of Kazi as far as with the sustainability. I think I gave uh, Rasadai a few a bottle of it the last time I was in Ethiopia as well. Um, so that's one of the main products that we'll be continuing to use. Cocoa is, uh, you know, everybody knows cocoa for chocolate. Ghana is um, the second largest producer of cocoa in the world next to Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, which is right next door to Ghana. Most people use it for chocolate, but there are so many other uses for cocoa. And particularly, cocoa grows abundantly in Liatewote, the village that we're in. They a lot of cocoa farms. So we're looking to continue that um, initiative and utilizing the black soap. And in, you know, there are other products as well um, that are available. Um, we will more than likely be in Liatewote and at, at the Kazi site 
our main focus will be on bamboo related products whether it's furniture arts and crafts and other uses of, of the bamboo a because it's so abundant and B we see this as an opportunity to create a niche for um, the community that they can have some economic um, sustainability that's a piece um, another component is Another question you asked about the collective land purchasing. There have been a few entities and organizations that have purchased land collectively. Uh, Fihankra, some of you may know of Fihankra. Um, it was started several years ago, probably about Papacho, 20 years ago. Papacho, uh, mm -hmm. Baba your, your Mac is going to go to sleep soon if you don't plug it in. We can see that on your screen. I don't know if uh -oh. you plugged it in. I couldn't even see that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, see if I can get my laptop plugged. Hold on. No worries. And um, while you're looking for the plug, I would like to remind everybody, um, I'm typing in your questions and he will answer them. You got it? And uh, I'm actually getting ready to um, have to sign off in about five minutes. Okay. Right. Um, I'm, I'm plugging it up. So anyway, yeah. Um, so, the, so Fianca is one organization that had purchased, had gotten land um, some years ago from some of the chiefs in reference to Africans returning and the land is there however you know there has been a little bit of controversy with the land um, in particular two of the two elder sisters who were from the Detroit and who had been living on the land were killed last year and um, without going to it long on this call there was some um, there were there was some challenges um, before that that led to some of this that still have to be worked out and what I would say is that there are opportunities to collectively purchase land however what I can say and why we started um, with with even just the four acres that we started with it's a quote from Haile Selassie that I always love to quote that that gives me a perspective on what we do it and the quote is saying that it, it is more effective to efficiently exploit a small tract of land than to lay claims to a vast tract of idle land. And what I mean by that is that um that many times people will go in and say, hey, I want to have a hundred acres that I'm going to use and I'm going to farm up. And they may only use a half an acre really in reality because it's more than what they expected. You know, they may not be farmers. They may just have been able to purchase a hundred acres because maybe they got it for two dollars an acre or something. But what happens is because the, the concept of land that we see it is different in many times than the African concept of land, people see you get 100 acres, they're expecting you to utilize 100 acres. But when you have 100 acres and you just saying it's my land and then the next thing you know that land is just laying fallow, nothing's happening, nothing's growing, people say you're wasteful. Why would you just have land and it's being wasted? So a lot of times when people buy a whole bunch of land and don't use it, it actually creates a bad rapport because now the indigenous people look at it as being wasteful that you have all of this land that's yours as an individual or even as a collective that you're not using so what I encourage people to do if you are going to collectively purchase land start off small start off small and build onto it because what we're doing even with this this initial project we purchased this land um, but it, it was it was minimal um, when I say minimal, you know, the four acres that we have, we it's roughly about a little less than three thousand dollars that we purchased for this four acres, right? Um, but that's a small amount of land. There's plenty of land around. It's being farmed, but we didn't want to purchase a whole bunch of land and then not use the land, and and we really waste the land. So it's better to start off small, and when you can sh you can build up trust, and you can build up a level of of, of good communication and good rapport that you can actually accomplish something land is can be given or you know bequeathed to, to someone so I always encourage people to start off basic versus trying to be grand unless you're used to farming you know 15 20 acres don't go in and buy 15 20 acres just to tell people oh yeah I got 15 acres in Africa because the people in the USA wow you got 15 acres in Africa but then the people on the continent looking at you like yo you got 15 acres but you wasting 14 and a half of it you know what I mean so I always encourage people as we go we have to make sure our mind state that we really take as much of the European out of our mind when we go to Africa and the reality is I'll say this even for myself we are Europeanized whether we wear African clothes have African name or not when we live in this society we're Europeanized there are certain things that we have to 
we're going to eventually have to um, cleanse out of ourselves as a people because we come with a certain rest of mentality regardless of how quote unquote pan-African we are. Um, and so I think that's one of the ideas around this concept of land. I think a lot of people who go to the continent um, mismanage land because they, you know, in the U.S. we're not used to acres and acres. You know, we got our little half acre plot with our house on and we manage that, but we now think we're going to take 10 acres and we don't know how to handle 10 acres. So um, there are opportunities to collectively get land. I would just say be mindful when we do that, that we're not just buying land just to say we have it. Um, I see some other questions on here. Am I still on, Sister Raina? Annie, you're, you're you're still on. I'm I'm packing my bags in the background, but I'm listening to you. You you can you can take the questions as long as people still I'll on. Just answer some questions. Yes, you can just yeah. Answer. I'll answer some questions. I see 21 people are still on. Okay, are there any Africans in Ghana that you know of who are manufacturing solar panels? Um, there are a few solar manufacturers in Ghana. Um, one thing I didn't mention as well, there's actually a company, and you can Google them, Biofil Ghana, B-I-O-F-I-L-L. -L. They they have they're they're building um they're building uh all natural and sustainable waste management systems um, for personal use. Um, and it's, it's a Ghanaian brother, so basically they're doing aerobic digestion, and basically similar to what if some of you may have heard of compost toilets. It's a similar concept, but it's not the same. It's not they're not composting in in that way. But their biofuel is something that we'll be using on our sites. It's a it's a it's a natural way of waste management um, for human and other waste that can be used that can be naturally discarded. So biofuel is another company out of Ghana, Ghanaian owned that we'll be utilizing as well. I'm gonna go through some of the questions. Um, do you use hydroponics, and if so, what are the benefits? Um, we talk about hydroponics. But I'll share with you my own personal perspective on both hydroponics, aquaponics, and all of those. I, I'm a firm believer in, in seed being in soil. I think that's the way the Creator made it, that a seed should go into the ground to produce. That's what Mama Earth is here for. I believe in the masculine and feminine principles of life um, in all aspects, whether it's man, woman, and child, whether it's seed in the ground. So I am not a big proponent of hydroponics uh, because I don't think that's the natural way and I'm big on doing things the way our ancestors did it. Um, but I know in some cases, if you have, you, you know, not much land, hydroponics may be a way to go. So um, it's not that I'm, I'm against it from a practical perspective if that's all you have. However, if I have an opportunity to plant seeds in the ground versus plant do hydroponics, I'm going to plant the seeds in the ground because I think there's a spiritual component of seeds growing in the ground that we can't mimic through having water or other forms of medium for the seeds to grow in. So we really promote more of the basic elements of, of, of agriculture. Um, and hydroponics to me is not it's, it's not on that basic level. Um, so, you know, I know people who do it and it's a craze now with, with aquaponics. I'm not a big fan of either one of them, um, to be quite honest. Um, another question, is there a way to invest in your collective and purchase a plot? So again, like I said, on the actual campus of Kazi, we won't have um, land for purchase because it's, it's really temporary and transitional space for training and learning and research and that sacred space. However, we definitely have connects to get land um, in various regions. Where we are, there's opportunities. And to invest in our work, you can go to our website, www.habashainc.org, to learn more about us. We're on Facebook. Um, if you type in the Kazi Project, you'll see more about it. Also, my information, you can reach out to me. Um, my, my email is info at habashainc.org. And also, um, you can check out, uh, you, can, you can also give me a call at area code 678-760-1252. Um, are there any other questions? I, I'm trying to see if I see any other questions. I think, is the brother Eric still on? I think, Eric, I think you text me. I was trying to read your text and talk at the same time, but I figured I'd just ask you if you was uh, still on the line and I could holler at you. Okay. Looking for Eric. Uh, What's his name? Maybe he's not on. I got a text from him. It's a brother I met some years ago. He texted me. He was listening earlier. Oh, maybe okay. he got off. I think he may have um, All right. Any other questions? Nothing from what I can see. Um, if they do, they know how to um, reach out to you. Um, 
either via phone, via email, um, or via our process that is listed under schedule in the event that you all did not get a chance to write it down. Thank you so much. Uh, the number is typed in the chat section. Um, you are getting um, thanks from a lot of different people. And somebody would like for you to post contact info on the. Would you go ahead and just email that to um, email that to us, and we will we will keep we will continue. I'm so sorry I have to run, um, but the session has been phenomenal. Um, hopefully we can get the audio set up and we can upload this to the site for your full presentation when you get the opportunity. Uh, we'll connect offline um, at a later date, maybe later on tonight or something. I know you're still traveling too, um, but we give thanks to you. Thank you so much. For the Q&A session, um, I'm assuming everybody's clapping in the background. You can't hear them. Uh, okay. But I typed yeah, in your information. Yeah, clapping. <laughs> okay. And um, I guess we're going to go ahead and close out the session. Give thanks. All right. I appreciate okay. it. Peace. All right. Peace.